Hello, uh, just to let you know, Dimitri Psaltis is also here. Thank you for joining us. So we start in a few minutes. Hi, Dimitri, this is Stefano. Hey, ciao, Stefano, come va? Come sta? Bene. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you, likewise. Yeah. yeah. I wish I now were in Italy. Exactly, you tricked me. When you when you invited me to this, I hope to be in Venice or in Florence or yes, something. Yes, yes. Well, me too. I hope to come to Como. Exactly. Uh, Como. Yes. But we 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 are, we are already thinking about next year to do something like that. So yeah, let's yeah. We, we, let's we will not give up. Exactly. If if we can resume vaccinations. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky actually. I've been vaccinated. Uh. <clears throat> Let me see if we get the passcode here. Passcode the access. So you, you can share your screen, probably. Yeah, I, I usually share also my iPad so I can make notes, but uh, let me see if I can do that. <clears throat> I'll give it one second if it doesn't work. Zero, two. Okay, so we are about to start. Uh, okay, I'll do it without notes. Okay. Do you have everything okay? Yeah. So I have to share my screen. Open my. Now. Okay, excellent. So you see the screen now? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so perfect. Um, so our next speaker for this um, afternoon uh, presentation will be Dimitri Psaltis from the APFL. And uh, we'll be speaking about machine learning for imaging in complex optical media uh, for 45 minutes or 50 minutes, something like that. So let's try to keep five, 10 minutes for questions. That's okay. And uh, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks to, to all of you and Stefano for inviting me. Uh, actually, my talk is reversed with one I think I there's a talk tomorrow as well, but, uh, but I'm giving the, the, the one that's supposed to be tomorrow today. And then and if still we're scheduled <clears throat> tomorrow, I'll give it tomorrow. So today, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, doing optical computing using fibers, multi-mode fibers. Uh, so it's sort of a new topic for our group, so but I'll tell you about it. So this is a classic picture of a, of a neural network, uh, which has some input data. Normally think of it as a vector. Uh, we have a linear transformation, means you multiply it with a matrix W so that you, uh, this is this WIJ here, to create uh, an input to the middle layer where you apply some nonlinearity. The nonlinearity normally is a threshold, a soft threshold. If the total input here is high enough, then this thing becomes one. Otherwise it goes minus one or zero depending on the representation. So input vector gets linearly transformed to an output, then the output, the final output is calculated by linearly combining uh, the, uh, the res non-linear response of this intermediate urines and then, and then getting the response. Now this topic was popular many years ago and I was fortunate enough to be part of that 
activity back then. But recently it's become very hot again, very hot topic to use optics to implement these uh, neural networks. One of the reasons is because neural networks themselves have become omnipresent, they're everywhere. People use them for driving cars, for evaluating your, uh, your, your financial data, you know, just everything. And then as a result, the uh, databases have become huge. And the thought is that maybe if optics can help, and specifically optics is very good, very efficient in calculating these linear transformations because it's just light transmitted from one place to, to the next. There's pretty much very little loss in energy or, or power you need to consume, as long as it's not absorption between the paths. Whereas if you do it with wires, by transmitting one electrical signal from one place to the other, you have to charge a wire and this process of charging and discharging uh, due to ohmic loss causes, causes power uh, dissipation. And of course, the, the nonlinear switching as well would cause the, the, uh, power as well. But in optics, it's very difficult to do this nonlinearity. So the recent activities, uh, basically they're called optical accelerators. So you go to a big database where you want to implement large neural networks, then you convert the data to optical, do the linear part, then go back and do the nonlinear part, either in silicon or, or some other technology. So this kind of thing called inference uh, was summarized here in this recent article. This was last December, so not too far, too far ago. A listing all the different, well, not all, but uh, a number of different uh, approaches that people have been used mostly for this accelerator. So again, the optics here would not be an end-to-end, -end, would not process the data, would not implement a neural network. Uh, uh, entirely it, it just it just uh, so these are the activities now a subset of this kind of activity is called uh, our networks whose first layer if it's a two-layer network whose first layer has fixed weights and only the second layer has adapted weights this can generalize to multi-layer networks in other words networks beyond uh, beyond two layers but here we have fixed weights and then here we have uh, adaptable weights. So since for optics and any technology really, it's easier to do fixed weights, uh, maybe there's an opportunity for that here as well. So again, the nonlinearity would be done somehow else, and etc. There's a several classes of uh, machine learning architectures or algorithms or techniques that fall into this, like reservoir computing is a very interesting uh, paradigm support vector machines probably the most solid uh, machine learning method there is extreme learning machines. all these things fall into this category so what i'll be discussing to you is somewhat similar to that but but not quite because in what we do the nonlinearity is also included in this uh, front part now just briefly, there's a couple of, several other people have approached this problem. Uh, you know, the problem of having optical fixed front end and followed by a digital, mostly generally this would be done digitally, the second part, uh, the adaptable ways. Uh, I'll, I'll present two examples. One is from Sylvain Gigant's group in, uh, in Paris. Uh, so random projections through multiple optical scattering and approximated. So the idea of Sigan was to implement this front part, the random weights using a scattering medium, and then pass that on to a detector, which then digitally would do the, the back part. So that's what's shown here. The data to be processed goes on to a light modulator, and then a scattering medium presents a speckle pattern. So it's a, it's a sort of random mapping from some input image, the data you wanna process to the detector, speckle pattern, and then that goes on to. Uh, by the way, can you see my pointer when I point it? Huh? Hello? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, that's also good to know that somebody's there. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, this uh, this is the, the random mapping. And, and actually, they've started a company on this, which they just announced a product doing this. 
Again, the advantage here is that doing this uh, optically is almost costs nothing because just the amount of laser light you need to have enough photons for this camera to detect it. And other than that, and also I guess the SLM to drive the SLM. Another approach, also very recent, is still in archives uh, by Daniel Brunner's lab in Besan in France, in Besançon, also in France. He, he uses a fiber as well, like we do, but only as a connecting, something to make random connections. So he called this a reservoir computing architecture in the event you know what that is. So you have an input that comes onto the DMD, it gets somehow uh, mapped to many points on an array of pixels, lasers that talk to one another. And then you have a trained output layer on the single detector. So, uh, and this is the architectural layout of his, of his apparatus. Uh, Again, so he also classified different databases. So the nice thing about both of these architectures is that uh, both this and this, that they actually apply to real data sets that people normally run on uh, GPUs, this graphic processing, you know, this digital hardware and produce results. And so now do it on the optical architecture. Okay, so then I'll tell you about our approach, what, what we do. So we take data we'd like to process. Let's say we recognize faces, we have databases of faces. We put it on the SLM. Then that gets coupled to a multi-mode fiber. Then it propagates for a long distance. Typically uh, in our experiment, I'll be showing you about five meter long fiber. Then this transformation is, uh, even with the low power intensities, it's, if it's linear, the fiber is a green fiber, so it has this periodic focusing. Green stands for graded index, it's a, like a series of lenses. So, and then it, by the time it comes at the output, it becomes a speckle pattern just because of model dispersion, just because the different modes become, uh, come out of phase and randomly, or apparently they appear to be randomly interfering. Now if we increase the light intensity here, then nonlinearity kicks in and then and then the pattern changes. So it's those patterns that we take and we pass them onto a digital computer, which classifies them. So, uh, so the classification of this, of this digital network, at low powers, it's, it's not separable, but at low powers, it can separate. At high powers, it can separate. So I'll try to explain to you now how, how this works and show you some results. The system is very simple in the lab. We have an SLM. In this, in that, uh, in the picture I show, it's a just an Elcos device, a liquid crystal and silicon device. Simple. It's very slow right now, but uh, relatively slow. Uh, right now we use something that's a hundred hertz, but hundred frames per second. And this is the multi-mode fiber, and then the output goes to a detector. Very simple. So we tried this by using a database of X-ray images of uh, of lungs. Uh, there were lungs that were uh, had COVID disease or healthy lungs. So they look like this. So this is this is the X-ray images, and the color is simply to uh, to map the, the intensity that we see in this signal. So uh, this is what goes on to the SLM in black and white. Uh, the, the top images and what goes in the bot, what comes out the other end of the fiber is images like this. So um, for those of you that know, there is some evidence of some beam cleaning going on. Some, some, uh, the output is not completely speckle at this given power. So what we do is you take these images and become the training set to train a one layer network to classify whether the lung as COVID or not. So that's the task. This is what happens when we change the power. This is the spectrum of the light that comes out. And this is the actual light intensity distribution. So by changing the power, you see different distribution. And the question is, do we need to, what, what's the best power to use? Uh, with the assumption that uh, a nonlinear uh, a nonlinear uh, response of the first layer is, is important. And uh, 
So to do that, we just ran different experiments. So what you see here is uh, the pulse power was, the peak power of the pulses was two kilowatts, three kilowatts per centimeter square and, and, and uh, 3.4. And by increasing the, the intensity of the light source, the accuracy with which uh, the uh, pictures of the lungs were classified improved from 78 to 81 to 91. These are the training curves. In other words, this is the accuracy of the training and the test set. And the two coincide, which is what you want to avoid overtraining. In other words, this is uh, as a function of training cycles. What is the accuracy on the test set and the corresponding on uh, the training set and the corresponding on the test set and the two follow. And this is the confusion mark. So, so out of the images that we had in the uh, in the test set, which were 500, uh, almost 250, 250 into 50 is half. And this is the number correct for each of the two cl classes. And this is the number of errors. And then it improves. So the training set had 2,000 total samples. Now you look at that. There is a lot of a lot of work on this kind of thing in. in on the digital side, just people using this this same database to process it digitally. So some of these nets may be recognized, a VGG net, a ResNet, and so forth. So the accuracy is not quite uh, uh, quite as, we don't have accuracy quite as good as, as some of the best ones, but I'll show you in a second something that's even better than this. But anyway, you get out of this system, which is this system, you get this kind of performance on real data uh, on a relevant example. We did another thing where we recognized from a spoken recording digits. In other words, I would say one, two, nine, and etc. And then uh, this recording would be placed on the SLM as a function of time and spectrum. So do the short term spectral representation. It makes a two dimensional image that way because it's time and then spectral components. So this, this uh, segments of uh, spoken spoken digits become two dimensional patterns on the SLM. Then we train the SLM with a big training set and the accuracy we get with uh, with uh, the system is 99% and the best one reported in the literature is 98%. We, by the way, we call the system SOLO, which stands for uh, Scalable Optical Learning Operator. Just, just like most acronyms, it just sounds good, SOLO. But it's just that, it's just the fiber, and the SLM and the detector. We also applied it to a driving data set that's available on, on the internet. The idea here, you have a virtual road, it's supposed to drive. And then uh, there's a, uh, a left and right camera and then a center camera looking forward. Uh, I'll tell you about the random shift in a second. Then they use a, a neural network to uh, to give you uh, an adjustment for a left or right. So the uh, this is the desired steering command. This is what, uh, what, uh, what, what you get. And you get an error to train the network. Uh, this random shift is to simulate the fact that as you drive, if you do nothing, then, you know, then you can just follow this thing and have it predicted. But in reality, because of the tires or, you know, your hands, whatever, normally, you normally correct when you drive completely. So just to create this adjustment. So again, what we did, we put on solo these pictures uh, and then train the output layer. So uh, uh, the results, once again, are quite good. So you have solo plus one layer with, with dropout, if you know what that means, it's just some way to reduce the number of para parameters and then the mean squared error, meaning the deviation from what it should be is, is, is very small. And what's, what you see published on this paper that I showed you earlier is, is, is the same. Okay, so I showed you three and on the, uh, there's a paper on archives uh, on this work, which you can go look and we have several other examples. So for example, recognizing the age from the face, uh, um, 
independent we've done some predictions various predictions things for uh, financial data or other things so it seems to work quite well for a number of problems and uh, the question is why you know you look at this uh, i mean you take an input image like this you put it to the fiber you get something that looks like garbage but apparently there's differences enough in here for a network to pick it up so what is it about the fiber that magically allows you to to recognize this so i'll show you a couple of a couple of things that are not related directly to the optics to give us a hint about why it works one is why why random projections work uh, so again this is the first layer the weights are fixed second layer the red are trained to recognize so if I put a plane here, I should get, let's say, one. If I put the car here, I should get a zero. So we use this to train, we do two things. We train Adalin, which means we train a single layer by itself. You know, as the X would go directly into the red part and we train it. And to tell cars from planes in this database, the, this is the, this is the uh, performance, 76%, which is not, not the best. If we precede that with uh, a first layer where take the thousand pixels of the input image, the 10 by uh, 33 by 33 pixels, and map them onto an array of uh, 512 units with random weights in the middle, the improvement, the improvement is to 90%, from 76 to 91%. This is remarkable, We're just doing nothing, just multiplicate. So what's shown here, is the accuracy, like this number, is a function of the number of hidden units in this middle layer. So the optimum is here around 500, which is what put here. If we use fewer units, it goes down. Why? Because there's not enough uh, detail in the intermediate representation to represent a thousand pixel image. So if we go down here to, you know, 100 pixels, it's hard to compress the image so much. So that's probably why it goes down here. And it goes down here the other way if we use too many units here, because then we have, we have too many degrees of freedom, too many free weights. So even though we learn better the, tests, uh, the training set, in other words, we memorize all the images that were in the training set. Uh, however, we have, we, we do this at the expense of not really generalizing. Not, not really learning how to classify images that we have never seen before. Okay, so this random mapping does this compression, so to speak, take a larger image to a smaller image while preserving the relevant information. The other things is for the COVID data again, uh, data set again. If, again, if we stick to the same two-layer network, and we plot the accuracy once again uh, as a function of uh, as a function of this quantity alpha, which is the which determines how sharp the threshold is in the middle layer. This alpha says if alpha is very small, basically this is like a linear. It doesn't have a nonlinearity. If alpha is very large, it's almost like a threshold up and down. So you see that the nonlinearity matters. As we, as we uh, on the test, which is the orange curve, the performance improves consistently as we go to more and more nonlinearity. So, uh, so if we think of the fiber as a first layer random net, the fact that it has nonlinearity, and we saw it as well in the COVID data, as you increase the pulse energy, you get more nonlinearity the, the performance improved for the COVID. Uh, this is not a simulation of one or the other, but it just gives you an idea why this helps. And the fact that uh, the data is compressed or redistributed more evenly uh, by the random mapping in the, in the front helps the output layer do well. So still, what is it that happens in the fiber that, uh, that uh, causes this transformation to apparently be so so uh, effective. 
So here's where the images of the road for the cargo or for the uh, lungs or whatever, whatever the process. And then once they enter the fiber, uh, basically they follow this equation, which uh, perhaps you know, it's called beam propagation method. But you say, as I go, this, if we were to simulate it in the computer, we would probably try to simulate this equation. So the fiber has many modes, a multi-mode fiber. So the P, the little subscript P, means for the, the, the mode number. So if you look at the mode, this uh, P mode, uh, at uh, a distance Z plus delta Z, it's, it, it's what it was in distance Z, uh, delta Z uh, before, times a linear operator D, some sort of linear combination just for scattering or propagation within the, this is the, this is the propagation vector. It just this would be a multiplication so e, to the minus, e to the J minus beta Z, delta Z. Some coupling because of the fiber bending or imperfections in the wall. For perfect modes, of course, they would be unaffected, but there is coupling between the modes. And then the nonlinearities, uh, we assume it's chi three dominated. So it takes three of these modes and through the nonlinear coefficient makes them interact. So if we were to write a picture for that, you can think of it a little bit like a neural network. So the first is propagation, but then the, uh, the coupling is a nonlinear coupling. The nonlinearity here is mixes triplets and then, and then produces a new representation. But then you do this for millions and millions of times in a fiber that's, uh, let's say, uh, five meters long. And then the decision layer is after the detector. So in an effort to understand what goes on, we simulated this using this beam propagation. If you wanted to simulate a fiber of five meters long, it, it's a very tough computational problem, which is, uh, uh, if you want to think of this as a competitive computing machine, it's a good thing because if you could simulate it very easily, then you could just use the simulator as the computer instead. But it's very, very difficult to, to simulate. There's two methods. One is the to, to propagate the modes and uh, keep track of their coupling according to this equation. And this becomes extremely heavy. It becomes, uh, will last like six months to a year in, in NVIDIA super machines. Uh, the other method, way is to use a B propagation method, which is more tractable, less accurate, but more tractable. So we did that. Uh, so beam propagation says that, you know, you calculate each small delta Z. And uh, uh, this is based on a, uh, uh, on a kind of an extension of a paper by Genty and uh, John Dudley, and then a paper of our Sunday review. But we have what's called a recurrent neural network where each little slice of the fiber is, uh, is modeled by a recurrent unit where it keeps track of, of uh, earlier uh, arrivals to this point and then some neural network layers basically you calculate one little piece but if you can have a neural network that knows how one little piece works then accurately that's all you need because the fibers as you go in the, uh, along the fiber different z directions the input output of a small piece is the same so you just apply the same thing over and over again Anyway, this is what we did. Uh, and uh, this is this BPM method. This is the recurrent neural network that simulates how BPM works. And then this is the difference. So you, as you start at Z equals zero and you propagate some distance away, this is just five millimeters away, not five meters, you pick up a lot of error because of the inaccuracies of uh, the neural network trying to try to simulate BPM. Uh, nevertheless, it's remarkably good. It, it predicts the, the model would predict this as, with this as an input, we predict this as an output. And, uh, and of course the, uh, the RNN predicts something better. So the true, the ground truth is, is, the, is the blurry image because of the nonlinearity. 
the bottom line of all this is that it's very difficult to simulate the fiber, uh, extremely difficult to simulate the fiber. So this is not the right way to try to understand why it works well as a computing element. The right way is to do this. You take a neural network and you and we train it to simulate the input-output relationship of the fiber. As right, so we have the fiber in the lab, we present inputs to it, and we record the outputs. Input, output, input, output. And we keep increasingly try to make uh, larger and larger networks until we have very good performance on the training set, on this, in the examples we've collected, and and the test, the corresponding test set. I mean, there's new examples that we put into the fiber and generated uh, outputs. Uh, so since we have the system sitting in our lab, we can take an infinite number of examples, so we can do this very well. So the smallest network that we found that could do the job, predict what the output of the fiber would be, including all the nonlinearities, etc., uh, from, from the input, was a network that had 23 million uh, weights, it has seven layers, convolutional layers up front. And uh, if, we, if we keep continuing, maybe we can even do better, but the performance was quite good. Since some of those are convolutional, for those of you that know what that means, the number of free parameters is uh, not equal to the number of operations you need to do because the free weights that are devoted to the convolutional are get, get reused many times to do the convolution. And you cannot use FFTs for the small kernels, so you can calculate the number of operations. It's one uh, half times 10 to the 12. So a neural network that would simulate what the fiber does, input output would require to do 1.5 uh, tera ops uh, in uh, tera ops. So since uh, we update our input every uh, 10 milliseconds, 100 frames per second, then we could calculate the number of operations. So, okay, this is the uh, result from this neural network that simulates what solo does. The input both to the solo and the network is a picture of the lung. The network output is, the actual experimental output is this. And the output of the neural network that simulates it is that. So training uh, 100 epochs of this network for 20 to 6, it takes uh, half an hour on you know, very high-end uh, GPU machine. Uh, and the total energy is 42 uh, watt hours. It's changing the, it's changing the input, the output changes. That's remarkable. So now this is uh, the unit versus uh, solo. In other words, now we have the experimental setup in the lab and we have a network that we've trained to, to reproduce what the experimental system does. So now we can go back and find new data and, uh, uh, and uh, see how the network does versus how the uh, experimental with the solo does. And the solo still does better. The measured data, you know, the experimental data is 83%. The neural network does 75, which means the neural network hasn't quite learned everything there is to learn. The performance here is a little bit worse than I showed you before, 83%, because we had to split the training set for this COVID data from to save some, you know, split it to train the neural network, to test the neural network, and now to test the comparison. So there were fewer elements in the training set. That's why the, the number is smaller. Now, very recently, this is just the other day, a student came in and said, guess what? I ran the COVID data again. And this time we got 99.8% accuracy on the test data, which would be better than any published result of digitally processed uh, neural networks on the same database, same exact database. So question is what happened? You know, maybe, uh, first of all, yeah, that's the question I asked okay, So what changed <laughs> from the last result to now? So what changed was they repolished the fiber, they 
change some lenses. So it's just a different setup. Uh, you know, so we had to worry about it. Was it maybe did you change the power from the time you're running the COVID lens versus the healthy lens? It was something where, where we're measuring here the power of the laser rather than the shape of the lungs. What what is it? So it seems to be all all good, even though I would, you know, I'm not sure. This is, looks looks a little bit too good to be true. But it points to a problem that this system is a nonlinear analog system by and large. So it's, it's very susceptible to is how robust is it basically? How how repeatable are the results that we get? So clearly here we have a result that's not repeatable, that seems to be on the positive side. But you know, the next day it could be on the negative side. So the question is what how sensitive it is to everything. And neural networks are relatively tolerant to errors because by definition they are averaging results, they are taking many data points and computing the weights and so forth. So, but still we have to be concerned about that. So this stability test, uh, we have an input. This is from, I think, from the audio recordings uh, example. Uh, and this is, we put it through the solo. So this is, this thing. and this is the correlation. And as you take, as a function of time, you take the image and, and correlate it, take the first image. And then as you take subsequent images at the output of the fiber, you keep correlating them with the, the input. So we start somewhere very high one, and for the first 20 minutes, it's pretty flat. So this is good. So within this area, you don't see any deterioration in performance. Then something happened here. Actually, we don't know what it is in this case. Maybe somebody opened the door or the laser, something happened to the laser, we don't know. Then it recovers, presumably to some path like this, and it goes down. So there is instability, even though the output of the fiber looks like kind of to the eye, it doesn't look like uh, horrible things have happened, but uh, but there is instability. So something to be like if somebody want if let's say we wanted to make a product out of this or whatever, uh, you know, we did have to find ways to stabilize this. So this is this is flat. Uh, the other thing is, assuming that then you can make and do that, you can make it a robust repeatable computing machine, uh, assuming you can do that, uh, then what is its advantage? Because, and I already hinted at that, right? Because I showed you that uh, to implement this uh, network that simulates the fiber takes a long time, but then is this the best network to, to solve the problem itself, COVID? Uh, I think probably yes, but we have to prove that. Uh, but energy may be the most important. Uh, um, so I think, even though I showed you, we can do performance comparable to what they get uh, with normal digital implemented neural nets. Uh, a big advantage is that the power of the of the solar or of this fiber uh, system is, is the power requirement is very very uh, small. And to, to give an idea how big of this problem is, there is this uh, report in 2019. So to program this huge network, which is a big network, required 656 megawatt hours. And by comparison, you know, uh, a car, a car the, 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 for the lifetime of a car, the car that you use is, is this much. So it's a huge amount of power that's needed, which has, okay, carbon footprint consequences, and it also has practicality consequences. In other words, you couldn't have one of these things in your car, driving the car, and in the car, you have to have the machine in the car because you cannot have it through the wireless because if the wireless goes down and while the car is being self-driven, that's not a good thing. So, uh, uh, so the power is a big consideration. And if we compare power, NVIDIA is the company that makes these GPUs, these graphic processing units. It's amazing. The best one, the top of the line, makes uh, 6 to the 10 to the 14, that's 600 teraops, but it consumes 400 watts. The solo I sold you does this much. 
Now, when I say the solo does 1.5 uh, teraops, what do I mean? I mean, the neural network that we found that can do the same performance for, for, for the given tasks, in this case, the lung images, uh, is, the, is the equivalent. Because if I compute the, the computations that take place inside the fiber, this would be unfair. This would be, this would be way too much. You know, all these little multiplications of the weights of the history of the modes. This would be an enormous number, but this is not really what's important. What's important is input output, the computation that's done. Uh, what is the uh, what is the equivalent that you would be required to do on an NVIDIA machine? Uh, then, uh, then. Uh, uh, the optical system had just four milliwatts of optical power. Actually, it had more power on what is needed to drive the SLM and the, and the CCD. So the total power may be a watt because of this electrical parts. Okay, so this is how we calculate this. At the and there's a lot of potential to, to scale up solo because now we use a multi-mode fiber that has 200 modes. And correspondingly, only use 240 pixels on the SLM, but there's multi-mode fibers and and uh, and CCDs and SLMs that we routinely use in the lab that go up to a million million. So there's a lot. So if, uh, from a uh, thousand to a million, there's a factor of a thousand we can increase with very little increase in the power. We can also go faster on the SLM and so forth. Another thing is the energy, which is the amount of power times the time it takes. So for inference, if inference meaning just for one forward pass, just look up and take an input and see what is the output. Uh, for solo, that's basically the time it takes to read out the, to load the SLM or read the CCD because the processing time at the back is basically instantaneous. And for GPU, just to read that one of these networks, takes 22 seconds. So you have to, you know, the power may be comparable between the two, but uh, but the uh, the energy is different. And for training, the solo for training is basically instantaneous because you only have to train that one little layer at the output. Uh, and then on the unit, the time it takes us to train this network is uh, more than half an hour. Okay, that brings me to the end. So, conclusion is multi-fiber computing elements. I think they're interesting, primarily because uh, you get huge power efficiency due to light confinement, which you have whatever light you have, it stays in the fiber and uh, and it keeps uh, having high peak power, which means the linearity is, remains high. And you have huge interaction length. I mean, if you try to do this with crystals, you have to have crystals that are five meters deep and uh, and then you have to find a way to let the light from diffracting or scattering out. So working in multi-mode fibers allows you to implement nonlinear transformations in a very power efficient way. And for whatever reason, again, this is something that we're discovering. I think it will take several PhD theses for us to say, okay, whatever this fiber does, how come it seems to be so interesting? I mean, I gave you some hints, it's this random mixing, linearity but you know to be more specific than that I think we have to do a lot more work and the next steps would be to scale it up I talked about how we can have many more modes and and you know be even more con the uh, tackle even more challenging uh, uh, problems and also programmability now it's fixed right the fiber itself is fixed uh, but there's many different ways to think about programming it. You can uh, have a mechanical thing, you can have uh, a twisting, you can have a different mechanisms in the fiber ex externally or put, devote part of the SLM for the control, programming a part for the input data, etc. So we're exploring all of these things. So I'll stop here and take questions if there are any. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, that was really interesting. Um, can you see the question of the audience? There's one. 
Okay. Uh, as Rizwan, yeah. Mario Chemins. Get in the data. Uh, I don't fully understand the question, Mario. Okay, we have a bit of time. Maybe I can do. Mario, yeah, I see the question, but I don't, uh, I don't understand it. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is from Mario Chemnitz. Mario, if you're here and you want to ask a question, you probably yeah, should be able to talk, I think. Yes, I can you hear I, me? Yeah, yeah. You, you ask about the 2D mode field at the output of the fiber. And yeah. then you ask about, I wonder if it would be possible to get the 1D data. What, what 1D data? How to, to flatten exactly. the 2D? Exactly. So how I understand regression tasks is it's normally, um, I, I mean, often people are interested in, for example, temporal um, evolutions, like a data, like a function of Y going over time. Mm -hmm. And so this is for me like a kind of like one dimensional data set, like a function Y over X. Um, but your output is like basically like a large image, right? Like, like also like a mode field. So this is 2D output, but you want to encode, for example, I don't know, your variable X in the input, input field on the SLM. Um, this seems to be a very promising concept. And I've seen that you could, I, you, you also said you can do like regression tasks in the sense of you do the fitting of a y x function. So my question is like, how do you read out like a, a function value y for like a given input like power or SLM uh, phase uh, x? Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, the optical system will work with 2D patterns, both at the input and the output. In other words, the output of the fiber, the output facet is a two-dimensional distribution because it's typically about 100 microns. So in there we have uh, uh, a number of a spatial distribution. I, I showed some. Then that gets relayed or imaged generally onto the camera. So the camera is a 2D. So what comes out of the camera is a 2D field. Normally we have not much more in this case, about 250 individual samples, pixels. But then we flatten that. We make a one-dimensional vector out of that. And we put it in a regre regression is very similar to an Adalin or a one-layer a one layer network. A, so we put it into a regression or a one-layer network that completes the classification task. So if it's, if it's a two-dimensional input image, uh, like the COVID lungs images, then we get a two-dimensional output of the fiber that looks like a blurry, speckle-like pattern, then that gets flattened into one dimensional vector of data that gets passed on to a digital classifier that tells us yes or no. If the input data is time, as it was in the case of the spoken digits, uh, it turns out we, uh, we also present it as a 2D because we take the, the short-term Fourier transform, the, the setrum, and then we do this for over a time window. So one dimension is time window, the other dimension is a spectral composition. Mm. And it's this two dimensional uh, set that's projected into the fiber and then a corresponding image on the camera that gets uh, flattened again and goes into one dimensional, whatever it will network. If we have data that's, let's say if it's weather data or financial data, or whatever, it's just time sequences that don't have any sense of to dimensionality, then we have to find a way to write them on the camera. So how do we map them on the, on the input SLM? Mm. So we can raster scan them, we can code them some other way. Uh, so actually that's important because then how the net, how the fiber treats that two dimensional data, even though it originates as one dimensional data matters. Mm. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Yeah. Thank you. Next from Daniel. Do you have an insight to if this operation preserves invariant to some kind of special structure with a single point? Okay, that's uh, uh, the, uh, the question is from Daniel about uh, whether if we distort the input image, for example, rotate it, scale it, move it, 
uh, whether this would uh, work. Uh, there is uh, where the fiber itself somehow has some invariance. Not that I know of. There is some rotational invariance in the fiber just because geometry is, uh, in other words, if you rotate an input image, uh, the output, if for a well configured fiber, would uh, simply rotate if for no other reason, just from basic principles. Uh, it may not happen if there's mode coupling, that's, that's too much. Uh, but what you ask is true for any neural network. Take any multi layer network, they're normally not shift invariant. Now, these convolutional networks have some shift invariance, meaning different, it's not shift invariant to the whole input field, but different features that you can find in different parts of the image can be recognized and then, and then picked up and combined. So, uh, uh, and what we've seen so far is that this network doesn't really uh, performs equally well as these convolutional networks, which have some shift invariance. Uh, I don't understand, if, we don't understand yet exactly why, uh, but I would reiterate a couple of things I said. One is, uh, one is the fact that uh, you know it's like a random mapping, so that that, that sort of reduces the dimensionality. Uh, the nonlinearity helps because somehow the coupling between modes. But there's something else that goes on in the fiber, which is this beam cleanup. As light propagates through a multi-mode fiber, uh, in the beginning you have all the modes that the fiber can support, and they got enough energy from the excitation to start propagating. Then after a while, if the nonlinearity is high enough through this uh, four-wave mixing, some of the higher modes get folded into the lower order modes. And if you do nothing, you propagate long enough, you end up with a single mode, just one mode, the lower order mode. You can trick it so you can also go to some of the higher order modes, but normally it would go to the... Actually, Stefano knows this stuff uh, much better than me, but basically, and also our friends in, in Limoges have done beautiful work on this. So now, uh, so you can think of this uh, beam cleaning as a way of uh, clustering, because if it's completely cleaned up, that's terrible, of course, because uh, you know no matter what you put at the input, you get the same thing at the output. If you put low energy, you get a speckle pattern in the input, so it's, you don't have, this, have the advantage of the nonlinearity. But what could be happening is that at intermediate energy levels, power peak power levels. You have partial beam cleaning, which means you're on the way to some clustering, which uh, makes it easier to separate the classes afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just had a very small question. Uh, when you um, when you show the implementation of Solo, right? You have a SLM. Yeah. Where it seems you have both a phase and a amplitude or intensity relation, right? Oh. I'm sorry, say again. So in your solo implementation, right? Yeah. So the way you modulate the input field is essentially both a phase and an intensity special light modulation. Is that correct? Oh, that's a good question. No, what we use in everything I showed you today is just phase only. Okay, right. But that's a good question whether, because definitely the nonlinearity would depend on what, uh, on yeah. what, uh, everything would depend on polarization. Everything depends. So it's a very complex, space to explore and how it affects the performance. But we use phase because phase has the most uniform light distribution and also the ability to couple into as many modes as possible, the fiber and so forth. If we use amplitude, then uh, uh, it has other advantages that the ones talk to each other, etc. But uh, yeah, so no, it's, it's only phase. So you never did the comparison in between like phase only or amplitude only? Again. No, not for this, not, not yet, okay. not yet. Oh, sorry, that's, yeah, that's really interesting, okay. Uh, I mean, you can also try different, uh, the output of this fiber after five minutes is depolarized completely. So one thing we, it's on the list to try is to do a second decision based on the cross-polarized light and see if the information is independent enough that we can average the two decisions or whatever, let's see. At least if they, if they don't agree to put it in as a alert signal that the decision is unreliable. Now the two polarizations could in principle be 
independent or it could be very related to the no. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Okay. Um, Stefano, anybody else? Has, oh, I think there's another question there. Uh, I, I, have, I have a question, a quick question. Uh, uh, did you use uh, uh, femtosecond pulses or what, what kind of source and uh, what wavelength? Uh, was it? Oh, this, this is a very good question. Yeah, I don't know. If I, the, the, the laser was a 1030 fiber laser from amplitude. Uh, the peak power specified there, I forget now, but uh, let me see. Uh, Big power is uh, to do, do here. So 3.4 uh, 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 kilowatt. Now the uh, uh, so your question is what was the power and then the what's the duration? Ah, uh, the duration is very important, by the way. It's picosecond, so we stretched mm -hmm. it a bit. It's a hundred frames per second laser, but we stretched it to several picoseconds because you want this uh, pulse to be long enough so that this mode exchange can happen the nonlinearity can happen if it's too, if it's too short uh, it doesn't happen so we have some other ideas for working in very okay one way to go is to make it to work with materials in very very high nonlinearity and much shorter but uh, in which case you would have shorter pulses or maybe go even longer. Let's say you go to a kilometer fiber, assuming you can deal with the stability mechanical and otherwise so it's such a fiber. As you may know, we've done this for imaging, take a kilometer fiber multi-mode and image from one side to the other using neural networks again, but that is all linear. But if you add no linearity to a kilometer fiber, uh, then the power may be very, very small, but then, uh, but you need to, to get some interesting results, but, uh, but then the pulse would have to be stretched mm -hmm. or could even be CW. A CW would be interesting because if you're thinking of this as a practical device, it would be much cheaper. Sure. Okay. So, the, so the pulse width and the, uh, the length of the fiber, I think are related. And I, I imagine if you use a step index fiber, you have a much stronger modal dispersion. So the, the interaction length will decrease. Yeah, so that's why we don't, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so if we use a step index fiber, then we don't get this nonlinearity because the different modes get away from each other and then they never talk to one another. And, and that's a problem. Then you have to wait until you get other effects like Raman. Use a step index fiber, it's very important. Small question in the chat, if you want, there's a few extra minutes. Before. Yeah, absolutely. The next question is from Oliver uh, yeah, Neil. Yeah. The last okay, so there, so they, this, uh, yeah, this is, I kind of answered the, for, for Oliver, the, uh, Oliver's question is about uh, the length of the fiber. Yeah, so the length of the, we haven't experimented extensively with different lengths of fiber, uh, but, uh, we, we try to hit this uh, beam cleanup uh, uh, length with the kind of powers we had in our experimental setup. And then this was working so surprisingly well that we, you know, we were afraid to touch it. Now we hired more students on this project. So we give them exactly these different fiber diameters, which means more, more modes, different lengths, uh, different polarizations. So there's a lot to explore. But frankly, we, you know, the results were so unexpected that we could take this data and process it that uh, then we kind of froze the system in fear that, you know, if we touched anything, it would not work again. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but now, of course, we repeat it enough times and everything that it's... So the answer is your question, we haven't quite experimented, but we expect that if we use longer lengths, if we at the same time increase the pulse width, would be good if we, and then we can even have lower nonlinearity, which may be good for other reasons. Uh, if uh, on the other hand, we uh, go to shorter fibers then to get similar performance when from simulations to anticipate that we'd have to increase the chi three. And then uh, that might be interesting to make a compact system or to use CW. But the goal 
uh, one of the goals is to, to switch to CW sources if possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The last question was regarding the stabilities. If, yeah, we have one extra minute if you want. Uh, whether it was long from Bennett, eh? Hello, Bennett. So the stability is, well, I showed you the stability curve, right? The, and this was just on this setup that was, uh, uh, this setup. You know, the fiber is sitting there <laughs> in the lab. I mean, uh, we've done things where we left it there for a week and gone back in a week and, uh, you know, ran an inference and, uh, and so forth. But clearly, if, if this is a if you're thinking in terms of a commercialization or, you know, a real, a real system, uh, we'd have to see how to approach it. One of one possibility is to have uh, continuous calibration. In other words, when the machine is not used, just calibrate, you know, just take new data and calibrate. Uh, another possibility would be to build in robustness, to monitor the light intensity, whatever, uh, temperature, uh, whatever else. So it is a non-linear uh, uh, analog system. And one motivation for switching to low nonlinearity, long length fiber would be that. It would be that would be less susceptible, be more robust. Uh, on the other hand, if you have high peak power, you can have very short fibers, it would mean a very compact system. So, but on the other hand, if you have long fibers and CW source, you don't have to have the femtosecond laser around or even picosecond laser. So these are all good questions, part of the exploration. So, uh, uh, so to answer your question directly, we haven't experimented enough with different fiber lengths. We experimented with one meter, five meters, and one meter it worked, not as well. Experimented with even shorter one and high intensity. It didn't work, we burned the fiber. Okay, well, thank you very much for these uh, answers and uh, for these presentations that was really good. Uh, uh, yeah, you can get the best of both worlds apparently regarding length and uh, diameter for graduation. So thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. So, can I ask you 